by agreement among national governments and empowered to impose sanctions. So now he's talking about we need an international institution for the economy. And then he says later, he re-references as Benedict, as Pope Benedict has affirmed in continuity with the social teaching of the church, he says, to manage the global economy, to revive econo economies hit by the crisis, to avoid any deterioration of the present crisis and the greater imbalances that will result, to bring about integral and timely dis disarmament, food security and peace, to guarantee the protection of the environment and to regulate migration. For all this, he says, there is urgent need of a true world political authority as my predecessor blessed John uh, the 23rd indicated some years ago. So there he, you, he has it, you know, he's talking about the global commons, international agreement. Then he rounds it out by saying, there's an urgent need for a true world political authority to manage the economy. And you have Obama and the head of the UN addressing this. So at the same time as this religious stuff is happening, he's merged religion in this document. He starts out by outlining the problems, you know, with society and the economy and climate. Then he starts by quoting all these verses from scripture and uh, then he goes from scripture to talking about being, uh, you know, uh, social citizens, social global citizens and, and using terminology like that. But I will say at the end of the document, two other things that caught, caught me off guard uh, a bit was the fact that he has a whole section uh, dedicated to the queen of the earth. Queen you know? of the earth. A whole section called out to her at the end. And, and I think for some people, they know that that's also the queen of heaven, which is not Miriam, Mary. Yeshua's mother, that, that's something totally uh, different. And so the other thing at the end, again, the interreligious stuff that he's calling out, he has one prayer for Christians to pray towards support of this movement, and then he has another prayer for non-Christians to pray to support the movement. So my question is, uh, why are you directing prayers for non-Christians if you say that you're following you know, Jesus? And, and who, are you, who are the non-Christians praying to? Exactly, you know? exactly. Oh my gosh, Brother Kellen. Let me ask you this. Did, uh, when you were reading through there, I know that he has also spoke about, uh, uh, oh, what would you call it, depopulation, too, too, too many people living on the earth uh, type thing there. Uh, and, and of course, quite frankly, the one way that I see that, he's, that he can actually bring that into force uh, is by wars and uh no telling how he's but you probably know more about what he's actually stated in there that would that would help govern or or to change the the the, the growth of people on the earth what did you see on that kellen you know i i'll have to look back in there but I, that was one of the things that he did talk about was you know uh, managing the population of, of the planet a little bit better so that is part of the 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 agenda within that document so i don't have the direct quotes but i can follow up with you and get that to you but that was one of the things he did talk about interesting interesting continue on brother continue on you know so i just wanted to highlight just a couple of scriptures for those that may not know you know all all this ecumenical stuff yeshua said he's the way the truth and the life no one gets to the father but by him Amen. And all these people that want to say there's multiple ways he said that the road is narrow <laughs> enter through the straight gate and he said, few be there that find it, which means we got to look for it. We got to seek him, you know, and, and at the end, just going back to his whole comment saying the Christians have Jesus and the Jews have the Torah. Well, I want to call it Revelation 22, verse 14, which says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to eat from the tree of life. Yes. And, you know, a lot of a lot of the translations says wash their robes. And I can't help but wonder the reason they say wash their robes and in, in place of do the commandments is because they want people to stay away from the, the fullness of, of the of, of who uh, our heavenly father is and, and forget that Yeshua said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Amen. You know? And so heading into September, you have this ecumenical stuff by Francis, both on the religious front and now he's merging the climate theology and economy together. And so in September, uh, last week while they were passing the, uh, the, the thing on, in, in the United States on Friday, at the same time in San Francisco, Ban Ki-moon was in, in San, uh, uh, commemorating the 70th anniversary of the UN. And there's an actual video, it's a 50, 53 minute long video, and at around the 50 minute mark, you, people can listen and, say, and see that he says that in September, world leaders, including Obama, 
will adopt an inspiring new development agenda to end global poverty. And then he says, in December, the international community has committed to reach a bold climate change agreement to place the world on more sustainable footing. And so you, you, it's, this is all connecting, right? So Francis in December of last year, he called out this, this meeting. Then he releases this encyclical document that he says he wants the UN to use in December. And you, and you have the head of the UN and Obama praising this document that he's developed. And then you have, at the same time they're passing gay marriage, you have uh, Ban Ki-moon saying that in September they're going to uh, they'll create this uh, inspiring, they're going to adopt this new development agenda. And then in December they're going to sign this uh, climate change agreement. So you have to wonder, is it really about climate change since France has just released this religious, theological, economic uh, document and call it climate change. What are they really going to do? You know, starting September through December of this year, um, it, it, you know, I think people need to just be in prayer and, and really making sure they're in scripture uh, and not necessarily uh, trusting everything they see in the news. My my, my brother. Um, the other thing that I know you've called out is just that also in September there are confirmed reports that France is already working on this UN resolution to submit for the Palestinian state in September at the General Assembly. So you've got the the, the Palestinian state, you've got the, the, the new development agenda happening, you've got the climate change, it's all converging it uh, towards the, the, latter, the latter four months of this year, starting with September. And so I will call out also, just to show that the, 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 the people in the church need to wake up and not be caught off guard by this. But at, at the same time, in September, the, the 20th through the 26th, they're having the World Week for peace in Palestine and Israel. This is being led by the World Council of Churches, brother. And it says on their website, the Palestine-Israel Ecumenical Forum of the World Council of Churches invites member churches, faith-based communities, and civil society organizations around the world to join together in 2015 for a week of advocacy and action in support of an end to the illegal occupation of Palestine and a just peace for all in Palestine and Israel. I don't know what Bible that people are reading in the World Council of Churches, but uh, our, our Messiah was not uh, a Palestinian or he wasn't Arab. Not that I have anything against those people, but I'm just saying the Bible right. clearly says he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, Brother Kellen, uh, one thing we, uh, we're going to have to do here, because we've been having, for some reason, for live stream, a lot of the people have been missing some of the things that you said in the beginning. Uh, and, and if you don't mind, and, and I want to bring up something here from Giulio Miotti's uh, article here in just a second, since you just now mentioned that. But if we can, the first part, say about the 10 or 15 minutes when you first uh, brought out some of the other things there, I would like to go back and, and re-go through these things together again. Because, sure. you know, Satan is just, he's really bent, Brother Kellen, on keeping, uh, when it comes to the most valuable information in the world, he's there to try to make sure uh, that we do not bring out any of this information. But let me take real quick, because what you were just saying here uh, about being put out of, uh, out of Israel and everything, that, that's so much inclined to the article that Giulio wrote here. Um, and I want to just bring out one part of his article. It's called, The Vatican Wants the Temple Mount Taken from the Jews. And, uh, and he says here, uh, of course, he goes into the whole historical side of this. And, and I believe it was uh, Barry, Barry uh, Chamesh, or Chamesh as he calls himself because of his name being hard to say. Barry has probably revealed more of the information in the early days in 1993 and 1994. His, uh, I, I can't think of the name of the, the co-journalist that he worked with. His co-journalist was murdered. And Barry, he tells you that for exposing what the Vatican was doing with Shimon Perez then. And of course, Barry puts the blame of a lot of the murders, including um, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, onto Shimon Perez because uh, they, they, Shimon Perez was, is uh, trying to get the Vatican to have full control of Jerusalem. So there's been a lot of politicians that uh, he claims that were murdered by Shimon Perez. Uh, and like, for example, too, um, um, I'm blank on the other prime minister's name that when he comes out after uh, having tea with Shimon Perez, he has a stroke uh, and then ends up uh, in a coma for the next number of years. Um, you, you know, so we have all kinds of crazy things happen. But at any point, it has been uh, a, 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 a 
dying, oh gosh, what would you call it? It, it is a political, religious, spiritual movement to bring about the Vatican supremacy, not only of the world, but to put their headquarters in Jerusalem. And Guglio wrote here, he says, the Catholic uh, delegitimization of Israel passes through the War of Jerusalem, and the War of Jerusalem passes through the Temple Mount, the site where the Jewish people worship for hundreds of years, and the local point, excuse me, the focal point of every practicing Jew's prayers is under assault from the Vatican. And the reason he's saying that there is because uh, once they give control to the Palestinians, which really the Palestinians are only the, the, the tool in the Vatican's hands uh, so that the Vatican can control it, as I brought out many times before in Ezekiel 35, God shows, you, shows us that they're using the Palestinians in order to be able to do this. But anyway, but if they get, once the Palestinians have control, they're also going to take control of the uh, Western Wall or the Wailing Wall is uh, where the Jewish people pray. So they're going to be banned from there other than by whatever dictates they want to put. It says here, though, the Vatican PLO agreements have been signed to enable the, the eviction of the Jews from Jerusalem. This follows a memorandum signed by Palestinian and Vatican officials in 2000, which repeated the Vatican call for, uh, oh gosh, and there we go again, old devil, he just knocked off my line there, hang on. Um, uh, they, okay, here we go, I got it back here. They call for an international mandate to preserve the proper identity and sacred character of Jerusalem. It means a return to a time when half of Israel's capital was under Islamic control, the old city was closed to Jews, the synagogues were desecrated, and walls, barbed wire, and snipers divided the city by force. The Vatican is consistent in 1964 when Pope Paul VI, as you mentioned Pope Paul VI earlier, uh, made the first papal visit to Jerusalem. Jews and Christians with Israeli passports were barred from entering the old city, and no Vatican official complained about that. And of course, barred from the old city? Well, now they're going to be barred from Jerusalem. Uh, you know, I, I, I say they're going to be barred from Jerusalem. I, I feel, though, that in this agreement, there will be certain Jews that will still be allowed to live in Israel. I don't think it will be a total... Uh, uh, blocking out all the Jews because if that were to happen I believe that then we would we would definitely have a major war in Israel but brother Kellen if you can kind of expound on this and, and let's go back to the beginning of the news broadcast uh, uh, and, and I see we're having connection problems everywhere right now it's trying to Satan is trying to fight this but go right ahead brother so did you want me to hit the ecumenical stuff again? or At the beginning there where you first started, yes, the ecumenical, that's exactly what I want to come back to there. Let's hit that and, and, and just move forward again, brother. If it's repeated okay. in there, it's okay because uh, I don't want to lose anything. And I know the only way we're going to really get this up is for the people on YouTube. And so I want to make sure we have everything, brother. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I started off by talking about... Um, Francis's uh, ecumenical agenda that he started right after he came in, where he sent out Tony Palmer, the the self uh, anointed, uh, proclaimed uh, Elijah, uh, to the uh, the mega churches and, and and TV preachers like Kenneth Copeland, saying that we're all Catholic and the protest is over, and uh, saying that those that were against unifying with the Catholic Church were spiritual racists. And, and the disturbing thing is you had Kenneth Copeland at a second conference, actually, a few months later, another big gathering of pastors under him, all cheering about this. And, uh, you know, you even had Francis join into that uh, event and, and talk about, you know, try and reference Joseph being reconciled with his brothers as a way to say that, you know, the, the Christians need to unite. So, you know, leading even through last year, you had him saying having a personal relationship with Jesus is dangerous. You're not a Christian unless you're part of the church. Uh, you know, I, I did hit on earlier also the fact that he's calling out, oh, people need to rest on Sunday. Uh, but, you know, even on the Vatican website, they put out there, it says we change the Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday. It says it on their website. They don't hide these things. It's just they don't, most people don't go and search them out. So Vatican.va for those that haven't been there. Amen. Uh, but, you know, even, even this past week, um, there's been more ecumenical movement activity by Francis. So there was a three-day conference that concluded on Tuesday to commemorate the, the declaration uh, called the Nostra 
ate, which means in our time, is the declaration of the relation of the church with non-Christian religions. It happened at the Second Vatican Vatican Council, 1965, by Pope Paul VI, as you just mentioned. And, and this this document, the thing I wanted to call out again is the fact that you have to really dig into this. So it's on the Vatican website, but it, after you know talking about how. Uh, everyone can learn from all the other religions, whether they're Hindus or Buddhists or, or Muslims. There's all truth that we can all glean and, and integrate into our walk with God. This document from 50 years ago, it, it separates out the, the church and the Jewish people, you know, versus what it says in Romans 11, that we're all part of the olive tree. It says here in the document, although the church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected or cursed by God. So you have, even in this document 50 years ago, trying to make a separation and saying, oh, uh, the, the Israel has now been replaced as the people of God. The church is a new people, but, you know, there's still something for the Jews. And then so this week at this at this event, you know, Francis says, oh, Christians, all Christians have Jewish roots. And so I want to just caution those that, you know, uh, you know, say they're affiliated with the Hebrew roots or Jewish roots or Messianic movements to watch out because, Francis is going to start merging this in there too, as evidenced by his comments this week. But you have to read what he says, dig into it. He said that both faith traditions have find their foundation in the one true God, the God of covenant who reveals himself through his word. And seeking a right attitude towards God, Christians turn to Christ as the fount of new life, and Jews turn to the teaching of the Torah. Well, as I said earlier, they're not separate. Uh, That's right. He's, he's, he's continuing to make them separate so then they can merge in, oh, the Jews have the Torah, the, the Hindus have this or whatever religions and the Christians have this and we're all brothers praying to the same God. Well, that's not true because Yeshua said he's the only way, the Amen. truth and the life. And he said that follow his narrow road and few there be that find it. But broad is the way to destruction. So, you know, just be careful of that broad road because everyone in the world is is saying, oh, we need to love one another. Well, according to whose definition of love are we loving one another? And, and, and so uh, I also wanted to highlight that Francis, you know, is also looking to unify the Orthodox and Catholic churches again as well. Uh, you know, there, there's been two meetings with Francis with the Bishop of the Orthodox Church in Turkey. He went to Turkey and prayed at the mosque. And then uh, he had uh, this, this Bishop come up there this, a couple weeks ago the Vatican, and they said out of this, that a historic meeting between Pope Francis and the head of the Russian Orthodox Church is getting closer. So he's, he's got the some of the evangelicals, some of the TV preachers, he's got even the warm, Mormons were involved with this, and then he's got the Orthodox, then he's got the Muslims, uh, then he's got all these interreligious, also New Age folks, he's bringing them all together, tying yes. this into what he released on June 18th, which is his encyclical. In, in where in there he talks about, I just want to call out a few things again. Yes, uh, yes, please. His, his, call for, his call for one world government. He, he says in, in one section, enforceable international agreements are urgently needed since local authorities are not always wow. capable of effective intervention. That's one area where he starts mentioning these international agreements because apparently the people can't govern themselves locally. They need big global government. And then the next section I want to call out, he says, Global regulatory norms are needed to impose obligations and prevent unacceptable actions. For example, when powerful companies dump contaminated west or waste or offshore polluting industries in other countries. And, and so he's tying in that BP oil spill. But he says, further, let us also mention the system of governance of the oceans. International and regional conventions do exist, but fragmentation and the lack of strict mechanisms, regulation, control and penalization end up undermining these efforts. Then he says, what is needed, in effect, is an agreement on systems of governments for the whole range of so-called global commons. Another mention yeah. of global government, global commons. Then later in this document, he says, speaking of the fact he just had a whole section on how the economy is broke. He says, given the situation, it is essential to devise stronger and more efficiently organized international institutions with functionaries who are appointed fairly by agreement among national governments and empowered to impose sanctions. Then he draws on Pope Benedict and says, as Benedict has affirmed in continuity with the social teaching of the church to manage the global economy, to revive economies hit by the crisis, to avoid any deterioration of the present crisis and the greater imbalances that will result, to bring about integral and timely disarmament, food security and peace, 
to guarantee the protection of the environment and to regulate migration. For all of this, this is the big part, brother. He says, there is urgent need of a true world political authority as my blessed authority, John the 23rd, indicated some years ago. Now that's kind of interesting too, Brother Kellen, and everything that you're summing up there, especially with Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict was the one that actually uh, mentioned originally when he was uh, still an active pontiff there, that, uh, that there, we should have a one world uh, banking system, an economic system, and even suggested that the, that the Catholic Church be the head of this. Uh, so, and now he's citing Pope uh, Benedict uh, in an in, 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 in a, in a economic structure. Pope, uh, Pope Francis is actually bringing out in his encyclical, you know, of a, as you said, a one world government. And then we, we couple this together with the fact, uh, in fact, I think before the Pope comes to the United States in September, uh, he's going to Cuba. Uh, which he's wanting, in other words, he's got to put his feet on Cuba because now he's conquered it. He did the negotiations, now he's conquered that land. So he's been really busy putting his feet on every ground that he has conquered. And then he comes to the U.S., he addresses both houses of Congress, the United Nations. It appears from what we're seeing and, and, and with the encyclical that he has now put out for the groundwork that he's coming to bring together the world powers uh, into a one world government, almost as if this is being announced of what's going to happen. And I'm afraid, Brother Kellen, that many people, when we look at biblical prophecy and how these things play out, we may have blinders on ourselves because of some of the popularized different ideas of doctrines that have, that have gone out in the last, say, 60, 70 years. Uh, and, and things are going to are going to spiral much faster than what we anticipated. Uh, and, and then I'm afraid people are going to be sitting there. The next thing they're going to be doing is scratching their heads and say that, oh gosh, I thought that we were that the rapture would have already happened by now, and now we're sitting here under a one-world government, uh, wondering what is next to come. Absolutely, and, and I just want to note a couple last things in that document. You know, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying anything against Mary, Mary, Yeshua's mother in scripture, but Francis put a whole section in the document for the queen of the earth, Mary. That, and, and it was, it, it's, it's all throughout this document is all this weird, like queen and mother earth stuff like that's not, you know, biblical. It's like new agey and he's got that in there. But I know some people probably know about the queen of heaven, which is mentioned, I believe in Jeremiah which is the same entity that, that uh, he's referring to as not Yeshua's mother. And then at the end, he does have two separate prayers. So again, the interreligious thing, he says, here's a prayer, prayer for the Christians. They want to support this. And then there's a prayer for the non-Christians. So who are the non-Christians praying to? You know, I, it's just it's just a little strange. But, you know, the thing is that Obama has come out and, and endorsed this encyclical right after it came out, as well as the head of the U.N., Ban Ki Moon. And so last week, uh, yeah, it was last week when the gay marriage thing was passed, you had Ban Ki Moon in San Francisco noting the 70th anniversary of the UN. And there's a video of this, you can watch it. It's a 53 minute long speech, and at the 50 minute mark, he says that all the world leaders and Obama will be at the UN in September and they will adopt an inspiring new development agenda to end global poverty. Then he also said in December, the international community has committed to reach a bold climate change agreement to place the world on more sustainable footing. So, you know, back when I started writing for you in December, I wrote about the, this, this, the fact that Francis was talking about something happening in December. I thought that was strange. He's mentioned that a year in advance. So then you have this document he releases on the 18th, he says, which is the, the, the document they're going to use in December. And then you have Ban yes. Ki-moon saying in September they're going to adopt some new inter development agenda. So all this stuff is, is merging together. It's not separate. And, and so you also have at the same time, it's, it's been you know, in lots of media now that France is working on a UN resolution about the Palestinian state in September. You know, this follows the Vatican Treaty with, Pal with the Palestinian folks that... Uh, if you know, I only could find a summary of it that uh, the the Vatican newspaper put out. But in there again, it talks about Jerusalem being an international city for all nations and faiths, even in the summary. So who knows what's in the document? They haven't released it yet, uh, and and I'm wondering perhaps that's uh, they haven't released the full thing because there's a lot of interesting things in there. 
Well, I think, um, I think we're going to certainly see when it is released, Brother Kellen, that th this is the New World Order. I mean, for Ben Ki-moon to be making these the, the, the bold statements that he is saying about what's going to happen at the United Nations, and as you mentioned as well, uh, France putting together uh, to, to, to bring about a Palestinian state, uh, and, and today, being on Hebrew Nation, uh, invited there by Ron and by Bonnie, uh, we discussed in there how that, with them already building the infrastructure with checkpoints, things like that, the highways uh, are coming into Jerusalem. To me, the two-state solution has long been done. It's just a matter of implementing those plans. It's just like this New World Order. Uh, they've had for quite some time, no doubt, uh, everything in place the way they intended to do it, but it's implementing it. And one thing that, that really caught my attention, what you said there too from this article, is how that they're planning on, um, uh, I forget the wording you used there, but it's, it's basically to where they can end po global poverty. And this is only hypothetical, Brother Kellen, I can't say this is the way it would be, but I just, I can't help but wonder about this, and that is, uh, if, if the global economies were to collapse, for example, let's say whether it be done uh, intentionally or not intentionally, uh, if they can at least make it appear that it needs to be frozen, so to speak, because once the economy has been to begin to collapse, like that it in Greece, the banks will close. Once those banks close, then the governments of the world actually freeze all the assets of the wealthy as well as the poor. Uh, and at that point there, they come out with a whole new monetary system, and now they have the funds of everyone. And uh, it could be, just as a suggestion, that could be one way that they redistribute the wealth. However, uh, you will never see the Vatican redistribute their wealth. They're going to maintain their wealth, and, uh, and they're not going to give up one golden wedge, not one golden uh, garment, and, 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 you know, Aiken has got everything he wants there, and he's going to keep his. Absolutely. And, and so the other thing I, you know, I, I just want to call it from that document is that you hit something important, brother, that they, they have this structure already in place. And so uh, I've been following this stuff for some time and the UN has had uh, in 2000, they released what they called the Earth Charter. And uh, it was pretty much a, a environmental new age movement. And they said they put the Earth Charter in what they built as the Ark of Hope. And the Ark of Hope website is still up there. They took this uh, supposed arc, a mockery of the Ark of the Covenant, around the world with this new Earth Charter to schools, to elementary schools, to children, to churches all over the place trying to get people to adopt this. And so even within this encyclical that Francis uh, released, he even references the Earth Charter. He references all these things over the past you know, 50 years as a buildup to this new structure that needs to come about. So I, I think you're right there. And then just really quickly, I wanted to um, just a few more points. So uh, just for the, the believers in, in Christ that, uh, you know, need to be aware to be careful what, you know, and really listen to what your, your churches are saying, because there are uh, churches that are that are not uh, pro-Israel. And you have this movement on the week of September 20th through the 26th called the World Week for Peace in Palestine and Israel. It's led by the World Council of Churches. And on their website, it says, that the World Council of Churches invites member churches, faith-based communities, and civil society organizations around the world to join together in 2015 for a week of advocacy and action in support of an end to the illegal occupation of Palestine and a just peace for all in Palestine and Israel. And I looked this up, and there are churches in Europe and North America already signed up and supporting this thing. So you have all these different religious, economic, social uh, things that are happening. And, and so with that, I just wanted to, to, to just wrap up my, my part and, and highlight the conference that you and, and, and your wife will be I speaking I was at. going to ask you if you would, in wrapping that up, Brother Kellen, can you give all the details to the conference? Because this, it, it is so, um, I think, I think that there, it may even carry a prophetic uh, implications, the conference that you have done. Uh, in Israel that'll be this September 16th through the 18th and, and, and we invite everyone, anyone that, can, that, that is able to come to Israel, be there um, because this is where 
God will actually have truth being brought out in this conference here that will be on the side of Israel, uh, the side of Yeshua, not just the, the, you know, the, the, the evils that Satan is doing. It's a standard being raised against Satan, and we get to have the first voice in Jerusalem because of the great work that you and your wife have done, Brother Kellen. So please give every detail for the people. And also, uh, those of you that, that are listening here, uh, if you can go to Brother Kellen's, uh, the website that he has for this because him and his wife have given everything in their life to put this together. Uh, and, you know, they do need help in, in, in covering the cost of this. And so it'd be a blessing if people could actually help support this work uh, of all these speakers that you've brought together in Israel. And we'll try to live stream this if you've not already done that yourself, Brother Kellen. Well, brother, uh, thank you first for the kind words. Yes, the, the event will be live streamed online and recorded. So, you know, I definitely encourage people if they can get to Israel uh, to get there, to not be scared of going. You know, that's a trick of the enemy to get, keep people out of there. But um, the, the event is September 16th to 18th, and it will be live streamed online for anyone that wants to watch. So really what we're asking people to do first is, is number one, pray for, for us and all the speakers. We have about 12 speakers lined up, including four Orthodox Jewish uh, speakers, one being a rabbi, that they do, four that do not believe in Yeshua. So, but they are interested in what the goal of the conference is about. So the goal of the conference is, is really to address and correct any unbiblical uh, and uh, anti-Semitic things that have permeated throughout, under the name of Christianity over the past 2000 years not saying that Christianity is anti-Semitic or unbiblical, but there's been a lot of things that are still uh, sore points for the Jewish people that people in the church un unwittingly, unknowingly say or support that th they, don't even, they don't even realize why they're doing it. You know, I pointed out the Sabbath day one is one thing, right? People say the Sabbath day is done away with. Well, go to the Vatican website. It says they changed it. Uh, you know, yes. basic things like that. But we're going to go into some great detail. We're going to get perspective from both Jew and Christian on these topics. So it's not going to be just a, an event where Christians sit up and, and you know, try and preach to the Jews. This is an event where we're really, uh, it's almost a repentance type of event where a few days before Yom Kippur, uh, which is, you know, event of reconciliation. And the, the name of the conference is Reconciliation with Israel. And the end goal beyond correcting some of these are, areas of, of, uh, of things that need to be, be put away it is really to unify the followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. And unify with the followers of the God of Israel. And, and I say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because a lot of this ecumenical stuff is saying, oh, if you're a believer of the God of Abraham, you're okay. Well, there's a difference because there, there is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a reason why it's in there, not just the God of Abraham, because that's where they're bringing in Islam into this and saying we're all brothers. Yes. Well, they don't. And so people need to be careful on that, too. So this event is really going to be, uh, a, it's, oh, it's free. I'll say that it's free for anyone who wants to come. We do have some people in Israel that have already signed up. It's free for anyone who wants to watch online. Um, and, and so we're asking people to go to the website. And if you want to attend in person, uh, there's a link there for you to go to the event bright website to enter your information so we know that you're coming. And then also we do have um, a sign up for those that want to see the live stream. So if you just go and fill out that form, just your name and your email, we'll send out the link uh, right a, a couple of days before the event, just so you have it on your calendar and know how to ex access the, the live stream. We'll also post it on YouTube, brother. And you're welcome to live stream on your feet to your followers. Uh, there's a few other yeah. ministries that want, are patching into the live stream. So we want to get this out as broadly as possible because what we're going to be able to do is show our, 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 our brothers that are, that are Jewish brothers that haven't believed in Yeshua yet just exactly who Yeshua was and, and who we believe he is to be based on scripture, not based on, on unbiblical and anti-Semitic things. Yeah. Uh, so that's the goal. One of the things after the conference, which is actually already gaining steam, you'll see this on the website, and the website is reconciliationwithisrael.com. Is, is these things called truth shops. So the Father put on our heart, and we didn't know that we were doing this event, by the way, when we started work, writing for you in December. We, we just, uh, we had this event dropped in our hearts in February, and I didn't even know how, not even half, I didn't know probably about 90, 95% of what was happening uh, being planned for September. Um, 
but when I when when the Father put this on our heart, it just so happened that this event is taking place at the same time all these things are converging. And so you had these things called truth shops. And 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 I will say this that none of this is about myself or, or putting a name out there for me. Uh, I'm not currently speaking at the event. We do have, uh, as I mentioned, four Orthodox Jewish speakers. We have a good mix of Jewish. Uh, uh, believers in Yeshua actually speaking like yourself, brother. We have others like yourself speaking there to show your brothers that uh, who who Messiah actually is, is, is prophesied in Scripture. But these truth shots are really going to be about developing relationship and, and small, you know, 10, 15 person gatherings made up of Christians and Jews going through these things in more granular detail. We're developing some uh, PowerPoints and, and, and teaching materials to facilitate workshops where people can sign up if they want to start a workshop, whether it be online or in their city, to really sit down face to face and discuss these issues over the year. And we actually have a, a, a location in Florida that's actually opened up, a woman there that has been working with the Jewish community for 30 years there. She's actually got three congregations already. Uh, she's got in the works uh, and, and also she's got contacts with synagogues that are opening the door. So it looks like Florida is going to be the, the launching point of this. And then we also have a gentleman in Missouri that's also stepped to, to do this. And we have a person in, in the UK as well. So this is something that because of the technology we have, we can spread the truth. We don't have to, Amen. Be hit, we don't have to, you know, be hidden under a rock right now. So, you know, the, the, the father said, uh, seek me while I may be, while I, while I can be found. So I encourage people like like you, brother, are doing to, to spread the truth and seek the truth while it can be found. Um, you know, we have so so much access to Bibles and the Internet and, and uh, you know, all these different sources. And so, you know, I also often say, what excuse are we going to have uh, when we sit in front of the Father and, and Yeshua and say, I didn't have access to all these resources because we did. And so, right. you know, go, go, out on the, go out on the website. It's free. All of this stuff, if you want to be involved with setting up a truth job, uh, you know, go ahead and, and, and fill out that form. I'll get in touch with you and we can get things set up. We will have, as I said, two, possibly three up and running before the conference. And that'll yeah. hopefully be spreading like wildfire uh, around the world. So the last thing I want to call out is this reconciliation with Israel paper that's coming out uh, on July 15th. Another free asset and we'll be pushing this out via e-petition. It's going to be about a 20 page document that is based on some of the interviews that I did with yourself and others of the speakers really going through these issues in great detail. What were some of these major areas of anti-Semitism that have permeated throughout Christianity that caused divide and caused blindness and, and division with the Jewish people? And what are some of the areas of agreement based on scripture? And really at the end of the document, you'll see a common set of uh, beliefs based on scripture that we both believe. And I, and I really encourage our your Jewish and Christian listeners to go and read this document yes. because they're There'll be a timeline, actually, that goes over the past 2,000 years that outlines major anti-Semitic things done under the name of Christianity and what that outcome has meant to our faith. And really, you'll be able to see the progression of, of how that how that builds up from, you know, saying the Jews killed Jesus all the way to Martin Luther with some of the things that he said, which then Hitler even used in some of his his things that he did. So it all was it was a big buildup. And it's not just Hitler wasn't the end of it. And, and, and so we need to, as believers in Yeshua and common believers of the God of Israel, unify around around the fact that our, our God is one and we need to love him with all our heart, mind, soul and strength. And so, you know, I just went in with this verse, brother. You know, this conference really is, is I think, the beginning of, of other maybe regional conferences and maybe annual conference in Jerusalem. But then these truth shops is really going to be interesting. Romans eleven fifteen says, for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world. What would their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Yes. Amen. It couldn't be a better, better scripture, Brother Kellen. God bless you. And, and those of you, if you'll stay on with me, Brother Kellen, here for just a second. Those that are watching on live stream, uh, God bless you for actually coming in. I know that the, the, the streaming on the recording aspect uh, is said it's perfect streaming, but it has froze up uh, for some reason in the live stream today. Uh, but that's okay. You can go back and watch it there. We will be posting this on YouTube as well. And um, uh, we're, we're about to see some incredible things take place. Uh, the, the God of Israel is ready to redeem His people. And that's what He's coming to do. And Brother Kellen has is, is given me such wonderful liberty in speaking at this conference as well. 
and uh, so that we can actually set the story straight how that Rome has even come against the Jewish people to, for the Jewish people to see how that prophecy has actually fulfilled in allowing these evils that are happening and, and I think Brother Kellen too this is one reason why uh, you know, even Rabbi uh, Rabinovich, uh, who's been commenting on the news broadcast here lately, he's been watching. Uh, he's an Orthodox Jew, an Orthodox rabbi in Israel. He watches this news broadcast, uh, and, and he's very interested in what's being said here as well. Um, he doesn't embrace uh, Yeshua to be the Mashiach, but the thing is, he's got such a lovely heart and a lovely spirit. And, and of course, we, we're aware, we have a sister coming here to, uh, tomorrow here to uh, our, our, the place we're staying at here in Florida where we do the recordings. Uh, she is a, a Sabra, 10th generation Sabra, uh, and she recently come to know Yeshua from editing a Christian book. And she's actually going to be translating in Hebrew uh, the book Yom Suf that I wrote. And, and we're, I'm working on a new one now called What Would Moses Say? Uh, and that one is really going into some deep subjects for both Christian and Jews alike that look into some of the, the wonderful things that the Messiah has done. And, um, and, and speaking of that, the Lord revealed another one to me just the other day. I haven't made it public as of yet uh, about where Jesus makes the cords, beats the money changers out of the temple. And, uh, and, and there's actually a passage, and I, and I don't have it in front of me, but I believe it was Hosea, where it talks about that they were, uh, the, 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 they, they used, they made uh, as, a, as, a, as employment continually, blood for blood. And that was being fulfilled by Yeshua uh, when he beat out the money changers, because they had made it, they had made it a business there in uh, at the temple there, they had turned it into a business there, and, and God accused them and prophesied through the prophet Hosea, calling it employment, blood for blood, continually. And then he goes on to say that all, the, he says, all the, 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 the animals are mourning and languish in the fields there, even the birds, he names the birds and the beast and everything. Amazing, amazing another insight. So. <laughs> I love you, Brother Kellen. We're gonna, uh, I'm going to go ahead and close it here. God bless you. I'm Stephen Benoon with Brother Kellen Davison with, uh, on Israeli News Live here. 